Everybody, first of all, I want to say thank you to West Cook Wild Ones. Uh, you guys were part of my teaching, being taught uh, a group of humanity. Um, I remember I, I had a relationship with Pizzo Native Nurseries, uh, and especially uh, um, this one uh, gal, Grace Kohler, uh, and uh, she encouraged me to come out to one of your Wild Ones uh, uh, events, and I, I, I just was so sold, and I was thinking, I've got to bring this to Evanston more and, um, you know, uh, yeah, all my clients. But anyways, so here we are and we are about to talk about bringing the Savannah home, um, how to add natives uh, to a varying part sun and part shade garden. So next we'll go to why savannas, right? Um, this is Middle Fork Savannah, which is probably one of the best examples of uh, a, a, an extant um, savanna in our region. And um, one of the reasons uh, it, it managed to keep uh, uh, itself so healthy was that when the railroads first came through, uh, the, the railroads would spark uh, fires occasionally and it would uh, keep the, the savanna cleared so that the, um, the oak population and percentage of trees would stay correct. So anyways, uh, why think savannas for home gardens? Well, one beautiful uh, thing about that is if we look at uh, this map to the left from thanks to uh, oaksavannas.org, uh, an organization that has been um, closely related to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, They've done lots of research and um, uh, picking things up. Uh, and um, I referred to their information a lot in, in creating this talk today. And you can see we're right in that sweet spot uh, off the tip of Lake Michigan, where the basically a savanna is where the um, eastern uh, woodland um, ecologies uh, intersect with the prairies. And so basically we're sort of a, a forest prairie in a way. And um, that's all the, uh, the climactic conditions uh, support that. This uh, ecotype is found historically uh, throughout the region and um, our environments can mimic these conditions then naturally. Um, oak savannas and an acorn. Uh, number one, um, the trees. Uh, savannas have a ratio ranging according to different sources from 10 to 80% tree canopy based primarily on oaks. We'll talk about that's 10 or 80% of what in what space in another slide. Um, two, fire. The reason oaks dominated savannas was their bark, both naturally set by lightning. Uh, these these um, fires, which were both naturally set by lightning and intentionally, historically, and currently done by indigenous populations and or human beings would set the fires by accident. Um, sun's uh, unique uh, relationship to the trees, uh, we'll see in another slide. And um, uh, water, the seasonal movement of water through the landscape related to slopes and swales, um, were valuable to the natural watershed of, of our region as well. So here we are uh, on point one, the trees. Um, the trees, uh, it, in one of the articles I read with uh, the Oak Savannah's uh, people, they were talking about uh, near the lake, uh, it, there was often uh, elm and black oak uh, dominated um, uh, sort of savannas. And then as we moved a little further west, it became more uh, bur oak and white oak. Uh, and um, so the, 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 the wonderful thing about this ratio is it's right in the sweet spot of, of a basic suburban, older suburban town. Um, the ratio of trees is one hectare, uh, which is about two and a half acres of land, would have less than 50 trees. Um, then broke, break that down, you get, uh, you have a, a city lot the size of 50 by 120 or even smaller, but about 6,000 square feet, you would approximately have three and a half trees per lot. Now we all must all have one parkway tree and then th that would mean two and a half trees per lot. Um, for some people it's more and some it's less, but, uh, if you start with one that with all those ratios, we are living in a savanna, and so being able to uh, make that 
environment or that eco ecological system uh, rich within our areas is going to be um, an easier task. Now, fire is, is one of the challenges, of course, <laughs> in highly populated areas. How do you get fire in? Well, sometimes, like Glencoe, uh, if you're in a certain area and you have enough uh, space around your property, uh, you can actually uh, submit for a permit and do a prescribed burn. And um, it's great because you bring in a professional. Uh, uh, Remick uh, Ensweiler is my favorite uh, uh, naturalist that helps me manage things for for clients uh, and so uh, we did a burn with a client and then we can remember if we're not allowed to do ban uh, burns there's um hand weeding and uh a dutch hoe is highly recommended especially this time of the year if you want to just keep some seedlings disturbed and, and and acting more as a green mulch and and focusing on on letting the plants you're trying to uh grow uh do better uh that's a one of the ways we can do our sort of hand weed burning <laughs> so uh just for grants uh here we have uh the the here we have uh an example of how it works it's very simple uh, oftentimes pe people think pretty uh, it's it's a lot more um uh Oh, dramatic than this, but uh, part of the problem here too was that the leaf cover was not as high as we would have wanted it to be, but uh, because the neighbor's lawnmower crew hopped the fence and blew a lot of the leaves away. But that's one of the challenges we, we're all having now um, coming into this new um, era of ecological landscaping. And um, here is that uh, same field uh, at the end of the summer. So actually, we weren't at the end of the summer. This was probably uh, the end of June. Yeah, we were we were looking to see what did we want to um, pull out, what 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 did we want to keep. Um, but the the client was really tickled. And before this, I should have I should have had the devastated picture of it was just a big mud field uh, because everything just kept getting blown out by the the lawnmower guys. And um, now it's a new world. Um, so uh, another thing about stewardship and editing and weeding is get to know your friends. So when you, when you put in your new plants, um, get to know who they are. And uh, when you invite them in, you want to know their behaviors and how they look different at different phases of their growth. For instance, um, this goldenrod, the zigzag goldenrod, Solidago flexicaus, um, is one that I enjoy putting into people's yards, but it does, I did have it on a larger property and I sort of am regretting that I didn't put in an elm leaf solidago or a, a blue stem because this guy is a pretty hardy uh, spreader. Um, and anyways, in, in smaller properties, so I find it's much easier to manage. And the trick is that uh, when you see the babies on the left uh, coming up uh, and you have enough in your garden as you see it apportioned, then you can uh, weed those puppies out. Uh, continuing with the stewardship idea of the garden, um, there are a lot of natives that come to volunteer in our gardens. They, they say, hi, uh, we'd like to be here, may we? Uh, they don't even say maybe in, in the case of the uh, common violet, <laughs> viola soria, but uh, we, uh, we can modify their presence in order to encourage the growth of some of the other plants. And then we can see how, how the other plants that we put in um, work with that plant if it's highly dominant in your yard. Um, it, it, it's, it's a process. The thing to remember about doing this work is we're getting to know a whole new world and it's kind of exciting. I don't know. I love it. I think it's just so much fun. And if you look at this, this violet, that's the common violet. Down here, I have um, a little prairie violet. Um, no, this is the bird's foot. This is the viola pedata and the viola pedata Pedatophidia is the prairie violet. Those two uh, are much more uh, tame and uh, grow a little, little with a little more respect for the other plants around them. So if you want to have violets to be able to uh, help your, your local fritillary butterflies, uh, you can totally uh, put those guys in. Um, also, we have uh, the Pennsylvania pellitory, uh, which grows often in, in, in shade areas behind 
uh, shrubs and such, a simple green mulch to leave in there. Um, nobody really uh, thinks much of it. Your shrubs do great and you have a, a great place for the, uh, for the red admiral butterflies. So I oftentimes will leave this pellitory growing in behind my shrub lines and such. And then uh, come fall and you'll see these guys sprouting up uh, as you're uh, editing and weeding in, in July. Um, you'll have to say, hmm, do I want one here or there or not? I'm sorry, I don't have the baby shot of that one, but the late bone set, the Eupatorium serotonin, that, that, that volunteers into dry shade almost guaranteed in just about any neighborhood in the region. And so uh, if you want to allow it to grow, uh, we had one neighbor uh, when we were living in the city that had an entire stand of it, and it was lovely. And uh, it it brings a little brightness uh, at the end of the summer uh, when everything else is kind of going dull. So uh, that's another one you can edit. So the third point about our savanna that we're going to talk about today, and this is probably pretty important in terms of thinking about all the plants that we're going to be using, is the unique, unique relationship of light from all directions. Um, and what that means is in a savanna, you have the tree, which is the dominant shade source. You have the southern exposure, so that the, the, where the sun is moving through from east to west. Oh, sorry about that. From, from east to west. And then uh, you have like the early morning sun, which is, is gentle and warming and lovely. And then you get the shade of the tree uh, when, when you go uh, over like midday. And then when you get over to this side, it used to be that we had an elm, elm tree here. You can see where it was taken out. And so this whole garden in the front used to be, it was set up for being part shade. And part shade, uh, we'll define in a few minutes, but it, it's basically uh, that, that morning sun. And then in the, in the late day, you have less heat. But now we're going to be getting a lot more hot sun in the future. Fortunately, I had quite a few plants in this bed already that were going to be able to adapt to that. And that's one of the interesting things about the savanna idea is that these plants have evolved and adapted to be in these sort of changing and varying conditions seasonally. Um, up in this corner, I, I have a, a, prunifol, a viburnum prunifolium. So that's um, a, a, a viburnum uh, black haw. And uh, he's gonna be lovely there as he grows up a little bit more and he'll have his little mini shade ecology too. And then we've got some uh, native uh, Selendine poppies that are, are blooming right now. Uh, I've got about a bunch of carexes in here and we'll continue to go through some of these plants. But that whole idea of the sun in, and, and where it's hitting your property is one to really start just paying attention to as you grow your new savanna landscape. It's just watch what the sun does and where it is uh, in relationship to your trees. And then this is, of course, my, my baby, uh, uh, my pet peeve. Uh, we have so much water in our region uh, that gets thrown away and buried. And um, we've lost that whole connection to the uh, natural cycle of that water is supposed to kind of stay where it lands and um, then be trans evaporated through, uh, through the plants and then also absorbed into the groundwater so that the Trees have more water during droughty periods, and uh, there's even larger aquifers in some areas. Um, so what we want to do is get that natural cycle of water uh, working healthily again and, and not throwing it all into the stormwater system, which becomes totally overwhelmed, and then you get local flooding. And if everybody, there was a statistic that I heard when I got into this work that if everybody within one neighborhood that had local flooding, uh, if 70% of the people took care of their own water by having rain gardens and such, uh, there wouldn't be any local flooding. And that's pretty cool. But anyways, it's an interesting thought. So you wanna slow water down, you wanna spread it out, 
the amount of water over a larger surface uh, settles better. It's it's more it's more easily managed by the plants. And then you you will have to percolate. And then you also have that spongy uh, root system that starts to build also like a healthy soil that has a, a larger life to it. Um, and then you've got the trans evaporation, the evapotranspiration cycle that happens. And um, these plants do this uh, great job. So you, you can see this was pre, this was uh, right after construction. We could really see how much water uh, was coming into these two um, gardens areas. And uh, we calculated it pretty well to be able to manage the amount of water in heavy rain events. This was actually to um, a snow melt and rain event um, at once. So we knew we were going to be managing the water we needed to. And then I've never seen that much standing water since we planted it ever. So the plants started doing their job from day one. So calculating um, a rain garden is really great. Take notes. This is my favorite, favorite website for setting up how to do a rain garden. It's uh, the Rain Garden Alliance uh, from Three Rivers, I think it's in Pennsylvania area. But um, what's, what's really wonderful is it's simple and it works. And I've been using it for over 10 years and uh, it really does the trick. Uh, when I started designing rain gardens, one inch rain events was really what people designed for, but uh, I'd say of, of the last at least uh, five to eight years, um, it's been up to two, two inches. So we, we had those heavy rains this spring and those were all like one and three quarters or one and a half inch rain events, depending on where you were regionally. So these gardens would totally be handling uh, the water that comes off of that. And I'll even show you one, no, two that I've designed that, that the clients are totally happy. Um, so anyways, you, you want to set, set your soil type in here. You're going to get your amount of impervious surface. So here's the surface area. That would be your roof runoff from one corner of your roof or maybe a patio area that's that's uh, uh, sloughing off water. Or in, in this one client's, we, we actually put a, um, a, a water uh, rail at the, at the end of the driveway so that all of the water goes into a swale. And she doesn't she manages all the water on her property and it's very lovely. Um, so then you set your slope. So uh, you can see here, it can be a four inch flat uh, rain garden. It can be with a six inch area. I usually do about a foot and a half uh, to move from the regular grade down into the rain garden or an eight inch deep, depending on where you are. And then whatever clay, whatever kind of soil you have, clay, if it's silty or if it's sandy. Uh, clay or sand are usually the ones that um, my clients in this region have to deal with. And then you press the calculation button and voila, you see if you have a uh, 200 square foot roof, you wanna have in a clay uh, environment, a 130 square foot garden at six inch depth, and it's gonna handle 276 gallons of water. Now, when you think about a rain barrel, it holds 60 gallons of water. So that would be 44, whatever. It'd be a lot of water. So uh, on we go. I like uh, using both of these little illustrations because uh, some of some of the illustrations sometimes uh, miss some of the things that we need to, to understand uh, while others pay attention to them. Uh, if you have, for instance, the rain barrel we were talking about, uh, you're going to only be able to manage 60 gallons of water in that puppy. So what, what are you doing with the overflow? So I always tell people, if you want to use rain barrels, that's awesome. Uh, and uh, if you're going to use them for food, you want to make sure that they're um, that they're filtered as well, uh, because the first uh, seven, I think, um, liters uh, uh, that come off of a roof after it's been dry for a few days, pollutant wise, is not good. Um, so anyways, um, and then uh, you can also um, daisy chain them if you have very limited space, because I know small yards is sometimes a problem. And then you can have whatever overflow from that might have to go into a little rain garden, or you can have a little rain garden but you always want to make sure the overflow goes in the direction away from the house. So you can see the slope here keeps going down. It's just 2%. It's not, it doesn't have to be a lot. Um, uh, and then you just want to make sure the water is not going to be backing up to make any trouble for the foundation. 
Um, they say locate 10 minute, 10 feet minimum. I, I can go, I with the sandier soils where we live in our region, I've gone to eight feet, no problem. In smaller yards, it's not a problem. And um, you, you just want to make sure there's no big trip hazard down into this thing. And you want to make sure that the slope is such that you can plant um, plants on it and it's not going to erode. Uh, you can also support the erosion problem by having stones. And I often like to, um, in, in this illustration, they, they actually use a, a PVC pipe. Uh, but that, that's good if you want to have a sidewalk. But I prefer daylighting it. That means keeping the, the water above the ground as much as possible. And uh, then you just put like a dry riverbed that would flow the water into the rain garden. Um, here's again the evapotranspiration that we always want to talk about. And then here's the flowing to the groundwater uh, or stream or whatever, um, however the system in, or in your area works. Uh, the way that that water flows. So this is just a, a, an example of how much water we calculated uh, for that rain garden. And you can see it was a 666 square foot roof uh, area that uh, ran down uh, two rain chains, was carried via PVC pipes over to this rain garden area. And it works like a dream and the water all comes through and uh, we have a brome set, uh, a brome uh, sedge uh, field then as our lovely receptive area. And the fun thing too about um, thinking about sedge, uh, sedge meadows is that you can keep that lower profile that, that, that is sort of more comfortable for people when they're near their entertaining spaces and socializing spaces, and then let the further away corner be the wilder place. That's one way to design it so that people feel comfortable having more wildness near them, but uh, you, you just kind of gauge how much uh, is going to be higher than three feet. So if you could have the, the, the higher grown ones like the Culver's root and the swamp milkweed, we, we, we'll put those over here and uh, we can always have uh, in this area, uh, these other plants, which we will, uh, I, I've gone in detail with in another slide. So here's a beautiful example of the beauty and power of rain gardens. Uh, if you see it to the left, these clients called me in, they were distraught. They had a, a, a big wet mess in their backyard during all these heavy rains and spring melts, and they didn't know what to do, but they thought rain gardens might be able to help them. And it did. Uh, I, I called them up yesterday and I said, guys, how did it go? And, and they went, brilliant. We had no flooding outside the rain garden. The rain garden totally did the job. And the, the point of this little uh, story is this is a smaller yard in a city. And what we always think is that everything has to be thrown into one corner that becomes the rain garden. But uh, the fact of the matter is there, there's a, a, a better way sometimes to manage things than to throw everything to one place. If you slowly but surely slow down that water, move it, you can see here, this is the downspout from the house is over in the upper hand corner here. You can't, it's just right off the edge there. And basically the water would just go pouring down the side of the hill here. So what we did is, although this is a beautiful mature elm tree, lovely, and we stayed at the surface, did not dig deep, but we, we made a couple of flatter areas where the water could just stop and gather, especially during smaller rain events. And basically we managed uh, what was coming off of that one roof uh, uh, runoff, that one downspout, which was uh, creating 192 gallons of water during a two inch rain event. So we slowed, they, we took that 192 gallons out of the whole formula. We only had to manage then the rain runoff from the garage, which was the 384 gallons. We, we had it set up so that if they were really concerned, we could have overmanaged it with a, a, a rain barrel, but they said, eh, let's see how it works if we just let it go like this. And sure enough, that the rain garden, these wonderful caroxes, this was year, year two for them. And they really, they did their sponge job brilliantly along with some wild ginger and, um, let me see, we had, yeah, we had, and ferns and uh, a dogwood. And they may put some more dogwoods in here over time. And then they kept a couple hostas 
because um, sometimes you don't have the full budget and it's better to have something green covering uh, than nothing. So adapting and adopting um, with what we have, playing with what we got is, is oftentimes very useful too. Then no more sidewalk flooding. Ray, I mean, how many people have tripped during the winter on uh, some uh, icy sidewalk in their neighborhood? Uh, that that could th these problems could all be solved with little rain swales all over the place and uh, create small habitats. Uh, we love that. And um, here in this case, we just did the uh, a sedge part shade one, and uh, we used uh, the Carex James CI James sedge, which grows very short, has a dark. A green color to it, sort of an evergreeny color, and um, it's just lovely. It, 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 it and you know, to, for people who don't want to have big, high gardens, it does the job. And then we have some great uh, cinnamon ferns, which are going to get quite sizable over time, that are inhabiting this um, swale as well, and uh, it's it's really doing the job of managing the water. You can see, and this used to be a big hot mess of water after big rain events. So, um, and here you can see what they did is they took the downspouts, put them, they buried them and put a pop up here. And then, so the pop up slows down the water a little bit, but when you get those gushers, we just have a little splash rock at the end there too. So you, you have to keep remembering that, that water has a force to it when it's moving in straight lines. And uh, so you want to give it a way to sort of break that, that straight um, gushing force. All right, so we're going to be getting started with a new yard. Let's just say you, you're coming in and, and you, you, you said, let's look and see what's here already. Oftentimes, people are surprised to find that they have some wonderful natives uh, that have been just sitting around waiting to be able to keep doing their job, but people haven't understood that they're there and, and part of the action, that they, they belong there and have, have been there before we even came around, but they not understanding the plants would hack them back or, you know, keep going, oh, that's just a weed. But I, I come in, we look at, at the property and, oh, voila, you got maples. How cool is that? And so uh, they, were, they were fascinated to, to see that they had some things that were just waiting to be able to come back to life again. They had some chuck cherry here, uh, the, the Prunus virginiana. Both of these are, the, they like that moisture sort of area uh, in a savanna that would be a little part shady. So that would be less sun um, uh, during the day than between four to six hours of sun um, and usually in the morning. And so uh, this, they're, they're, they're really going to be having fun with um, redoing their garden now. So let's talk generally about the plants. Uh, from, the, from the big ideas to building a new kind of savanna for nature in our yards. So we're talking about part sun, four to six hours of direct sun per day with afternoon sun. So that's that hotter, more uh, pulsating, uh, penetrating light. And oftentimes the, the plants that can live in this situation can also take full sun. So it's not always this or that. And whenever you're gonna do work with a plant, do a little research, pay attention to what are the growth habits and desires of this plant? And once you, if you want to experiment with them, you can say, well, how much shade can the echinacea take? So you'll put the echinacea in and then you pay attention for a year and you go, oh, he's fine there and he even will spread. Or that's just a little too shady for him. We're going to move him to another area. So this is one of the beautiful things about getting to know our plants. And then here we have also a um, skull cap, uh, Scutellaria and canna. It's, it's a little further southern uh, plant that um, is probably going to be easily migrating uh, up here. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's also a wonderful, the, the pollinators love it. And I, I see, I've seen the, um, the hummingbirds come in to say hi to that one too. And having a rain gauge in your garden is always a lovely thing too. So you can just pay attention to see, oh, my garden took care of that much water. Isn't that cool? Or I need, I need to water the plants more because we're not getting very much rain. 
Then we have the part shade situation, and that's where you have the, the lighter morning sun and four to six hours of uh, direct sun, but, but it's usually the calmer, quieter sun. And these people, these, these plants can also go back into more shade, and uh, they would even be found at forest edges sometimes. And one of my favorite here is the um, uh, myanthum, uh, and this uh, is the false uh, uh, Solomon's feathery false Solomon seal. And I put him into this uh, mix of this little rain. This is a rain crescent swale that takes water off the sidewalk. And when there's big gushers, the water will come in here, it'll fill up. And then if it's really, really, really a lot of water, it'll just go over into the stormwater system. But we're definitely breaking the flow and we're allowing more to infiltrate. Okay, for people who want to go totally geek, Geek crazy with the uh, savannah theme um, on, on www.oaksavannas.org. You can get lots of great plant lists, um, uh, really detailed information. And there's even a beautiful uh, discovery that was made that there are actually a, a, a few plant species that evolved, co-evolved with savannas and are found only in savannas, which I think is fascinating. And that means these species just have an adaptability to the ever-changing and shifting canopy uh, of, the, uh, of the savanna. Uh, Cananthus, uh, uh, the New Jersey tea, uh, this is a personal fave. Uh, the, there's a little blue butterfly that loves to hit this one. Um, you do have to rabbit cage that puppy. You got to really, really protect him because the rabbits love to eat that plant. But once everything starts growing in, oftentimes the plants are more protected. And once they're through transplant stress, they, they, they get better too. And if you can keep rabbits away, this is just a theory uh, that I've heard from some people and I've been paying attention to it, is if you can keep rabbit, rabbits for three generations, and that's about at least how many litters they'll have in a summer. <laughs> um, they don't get a taste for the plant. They won't hit the plant so often unless they have, are really hungry and there's not much else to eat. So um, that's a plant right now coming up and, and, and flowering. People can see them when they go to wilder areas. We've got Zizia aria, the golden Alexander, wonderful plant. This is one the black swallowtail actually evolved on and it's in the same family as the parsley plant and the dill. And um, basically what you want to do, though, is um, if you don't want them everywhere, you've got to seed, you've got to take their, uh, you've got to uh, pop the seed heads off, um, at least uh, some of them, unless you see birds really going nuts and having a good time with them. Um, I know we want to leave uh, food for the animals, but we also want to be able to create environments that are hospitable uh, to our neighbors and ourselves. And uh, yeah, so just pay attention. If it's serving nature and nature's using something, great. Then you're not gonna have that many seedlings. But uh, uh, if, <laughs> if, if you get a lot of seedlings, you can do some deadheading. Anyways, uh, then we have the Verona cast from Vir uh, Virginia. Virginica, that's the uh, Culver's root, uh, thanks to IllinoisWildflowers.org. That's a great source for knowing more things about plants too. And then I wanna try this one. This is like, as I was doing my research for this uh, talk, uh, this, this one came up for me and I'm gonna check him out in the future. All right, so look, now we're gonna sort of take a little march through, woo, woo. We're going to take a little march through time. Um, we're going to go first blooms of the year, March, uh, uh, March, early April, uh, you know, end of April, up to the end of April. Uh, you start getting some of the ephemerals popping up. And um, here we have uh, the, although it is not uh, regionally native, it's from more southern parts, it is adapting well to our region and uh, is, is, is not disfavored. And so the Hamamelis, uh, the Verna witch hazel, uh, has a lovely fragrance uh, to the flowers. It's really literally like one of the first blooms of the season. And I've definitely seen activity on them uh, when, when you have those warmer days. Um, I've seen them bloom as early as, uh, I think, late February on those really wildly warm winters we've had. And then as late as uh, like mid-April. So 
uh, it, it's really interesting too to see how adaptive the plant is. It, it can sort of uh, respond to what's going on. Also planted in this garden, uh, we have uh, the Dryopteris marginalis, the leatherleaf, uh, leatherboard uh, fern shooting star. This is the, the ephemeral uh, shooting star, which can go from um, the part shade to full shade, full sun. I mean, almost full sun. And it, 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 it's a very adaptive uh, ephemeral and it's beautiful as well. And then we've got Jacob's Ladder in here, which is a, a repeated mode in my gardens. I just like that plant a lot. Okay, whoops, sorry, going the wrong way. All right, so we, we, we were talking about that sunshade relationship again. And uh, here we go, um, here are some details from the Brome Sedge Meadow. Uh, in May, uh, we have uh, coming up, because it is a truly wetter area, we could have the Brome Sedge uh, in this uh, bed. It, it really likes to stay a little on the moist side. So uh, Brome Sedge with parts sun, and it's got, likes it sunnier too. It's not a big lover of the, the har harder shade areas. Uh, this was the perfect plant for the perfect environment. Uh, and they get up to two feet, uh, um, two and a half feet wide, almost like a, a prairie drop seed in the, in the height of the summer. And so uh, in this period right now, you can see that the, uh, uh, the marsh marigold can come in and do its thing, but then um, it'll kind of go back for, for the rest of the summer. Uh, the Jacob's Ladder uh, sits right nicely between the plants. And we also have some Tridescanthia, the um, spider wart. Uh, we also have uh, some, some more of the, I wanted to show the flower of the uh, shooting star because we didn't have that in the last one. And then uh, late May, uh, early June is iris season. I just love irises. And these two natives are just awesome for the part shade, um, uh, part sun gardens. Um, part sun, uh, if you want to get more blooms, uh, you're going to want to, you can use this uh, iris virginica var shrivii, the blue flag iris. Um, using Latin names is always good too, because you're, you're going to get what you're looking for exactly. So pay attention and uh, you can use the, the, the common names, blue flag iris, jacket ladder, when you talk about things with your friends. But if you go to order the plants, pay attention to the Latin, because sometimes you're going to uh, be able to, uh, uh, you'll be getting something different than you thought. <laughs> so you really want to be sure, especially with the sedges, there's so many different varieties and kinds. This is also, by the way, the, the iris cristata. It, it, it really multiplies and it has that great texture to it. So it has a really lovely sort of um, edging uh, placeholder uh, to it. So here we are at the June Broom Sedge Meadow. Um, it, things have changed. Uh, the, the spring uh, colors and, and size have gone down. You can see that the uh, brome sedge is really starting to do its spreading out thing. And uh, the, the star of the show at this point is the uh, Penstemon uh, calicosis. Penstemon calicosis is probably the most adaptable um, Penstemon to watery -er areas. And uh, here's, here's a little more close up of, of the plant. Uh, it has a little bit of a pinkish uh, tone to it. Um, and um, it really, it can handle part shade. Uh, whereas if you have a digitalis, which is the white one, uh, they like it hotter and they like it sunnier. Um, and then Hirsutus uh, likes it uh, part sun as well, but it doesn't like it as wet. So this is the adaptable pensament for watery rain gardens. Um, then I also love to pay attention to the different cycles of plants. Um, this is now the Jacob's Ladder, ladder uh, bloom cycles over, but look at the, the, the seed heads on that plant. It's just so pretty. It's just lovely. And um, now the Travis Cancia is coming up and I'm going to do some good stuff. And uh, that's the flower for our, our spider wart. And then, of course, the Golden Alexander's back in there. He's actually on the left hand side garden. Uh, which is the field garden. 
So uh, here we are on the looking on the other side of the garden. Um, the blue flag iris is, is past his bloom cycle, but boy, look, he still holds a nice statement place in the garden and he really does uh, beef up and become like, you know, like two to three to four feet wide over time. So just know that you can utilize that plant as a focal point uh, in your garden too. Um, when we look at this garden in the far right front, uh, we have the Rutabecchia triloba, uh, brown-eyed Susan. It's taller on thinner, wiry stalks. And um, it's, it's a short-lived perennial that um, will seed out and move around the garden. And what's really fun about it is, again, you know, paying attention to understanding what's the baby look like and what does the, the, the parent plant look like, uh, you're gonna wanna let this one volunteer in different places and see where he wants to come up because you may be delighted that, you know, next year you got the triloba up here. And so, excuse me, it, it's kind of uh, like one of those fun surprises about having a relationship with the garden and the plants. Um, it, and then another thing, uh, another plant that is sort of like that is, is the, the, the great blue lobelia, lobelia syphilitica. Um, it will seed around the, the beds as well, and you can make decisions. And at the beginning of the season, uh, you could see that there were like basil rosettes, like before it throws up the, the flower heads, and it looks like a nice tidy green border, and then all of a sudden, poof, you get flowers. So it, it, it's like constantly evolving and uh, surprising us, uh, these wonderful wild gardens. And then in the back, we have the black-eyed Susan, the Rudbeckia ful fulgida, the var speciosa. That's a nice um, uh, black-eyed Susan. The thing that's missing in this garden that um, I would probably uh, put in um, is uh, I don't have a sunflower in here. So we need a helianthus somewhere. But uh, uh, trying to get enough uh, food for the pollinators. We want to make sure that whenever we have any one plant type, we try to have about three square foot of bloom uh, area because whenever a bee will go to forage, they choose one plant at a time to collect nectar from. Or, and um, so it's really good to notice and pay attention to uh, having uh, that amount of plants. Now, you don't have to have it always as a mass of three square feet. But you put one plant here, one plant here, and one plant here, and that's equivalent of three square feet. They can forage very comfortably in that, in that region, and uh, you can still have some variety of bloom in your cycle. Um, here, this is uh, because it's uh, like, I think this one's from mid-August, early August. Uh, the, the bloom uh, cycle is passed for the swamp milkweed, which we have here on the right, the rosy, uh, the rosy um, milkweed. The thing that's wonderful about this plant is it takes part shade and the water. And um, the orange one as well will take, uh, that's the butterfly weed thing. Um, it will take the, uh, the water, but not so much the sun. I mean, so much the shade. So um, this is the, the, the milkweed for those situations, uh, unless you wanna go really wild and have the common milkweed, which I love the fragrance of, and I would like to have a perfume made from it. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if I would always invite it into a garden if I'm trying to do uh, a, a controlled design, right? But another thing that's beautiful about the swamp milkweed Monarchs love, love, love to lay their eggs on this plant because the, the leaves are a little more tender than, than the common milkweed. Um, great, so there's that. So now we're getting into late August, early September. Wow, what a, what a lovely uh, sort of peaceful feeling you can get from these gardens, right? And one thing that was just fun about this picture that I was that the year we discovered that we had a naturally occurring hybrid of the, the blue um, lobelia and the red lobelia, which is this magenta. And it was just like, whoa, look at that. Isn't that cool? And, you know, I couldn't have planned that. It was one of those little nature surprises. And um, I love being surprised. And here's a perfect example of that uh, uh, Jacob's Ladder now holding the edge of the garden and just looking lovely and sort of containing things and making them look, you know, managed. It's not totally wild, but it's it's definitely wild. And then back here, we have that uh, bone set 
uh, in here and um, that that uh, loves to volunteer in and, and bring some nice light color in there. And so we, we let them stay for that season. The pollinators love them too. So now that if we go to the front of the property, this is really more of a part sun. Uh, uh, the other one is also more part sun with some part shade areas. This, this uh, has also the same combination. You can see we have uh, on the um, eastern side of the property, uh, a little park. So there's some wonderful old mature tree canopies. So they're, they're kind of uh, keeping it cooler back in this corner here. Uh, and then we have a pretty sunny rest of the day coming through uh, the rest of the garden here. So it gave us the opportunity to plant things like uh, this Kalarui uh, 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 pop, poppy mallow that just clutters through the garden. It's just lovely and wonderful the way it rambles around. And um, it, it goes, I think, brilliantly with the, uh, it, the Asclepias tuberosa, that butterfly weed um, that is also doing a little bit of rainwater management in here. And it, it's sunnier and it's happy. And uh, back in the background, we've got uh, some uh, Penstemon, as well as some, we did let some volunteer uh, erigerants and fleabane in there for a while, but the, the client said, ah, you know, I know it's functional and it's doing some work, but I, I kind of, it, it's looking a little too much. So, and it was distracting from the culver root. Yeah. Okay. So we love that. That's just lovely candelabra. It just has a beautiful sort of pinnacle feeling for the garden. And um, another wonderful thing about this garden is in the front here, uh, this is just about to pop. Uh, you can see here uh, it, it, in a little more mature early fall uh, era is the Bebop Bee Balm, which is a Monarda punctata, which is one of these shorter lived Monardas, but it seeds out and uh, travels around the garden as well. And it's, it's, it's just really lovely to see uh, it and be surprised by where it shows up every year. And, um, then try to always keep bringing it back into where we had it initially in the design. And, and up front here too, in the first few years, uh, you can see uh, he's struggling a little now. We had um, some purple love grass. Uh, so we're, we're gonna probably try and make room for the purple love grass to do a little more this year because it's really just fun to watch it. And it's a dry edge before you go down into a, a, a watery uh, area down there. So, um, in, in the at the early uh, fall one too, we can see here we have the Chelone rubra, which is the pink turtle head. We've got Joe Pie weed, which is a rusty patch bumblebee favorite, and uh, we also had some Liatris aspera in here, some rough blazing star, and uh, again the Rudbeckia and uh, the we we had a Solidaga rugosa, the rough goldenrod. We did put in the fireworks. Um, which was a cultivar uh, because Piso native nurseries was, um, they're not growing it, but they, their designers were saying it's, it's a okay plant to put in. So we used that. Um, it's very, uh, very aggressive stand of, 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 uh, of goldenrod. So we're, we're, we're always having to sort of cut it back a little bit, but the bees love it. It's, 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 it's a highly visited plant, um, but perhaps I would have chosen something different. Um, okay, so uh, I, I always have to go back to managing downwater because it's so interesting and smaller properties are, are the ones that often get have the pain uh, of these watery event problems. And so this is my own backyard, um, very, very small back uh, city yard. Uh, when I moved into the house, uh, it, the basement was was chronically wet and and uh, almost flooding sometimes, and uh, there was a big crack in the foundation. And they had this downspout like going between the two buildings there, and so all the water was like seeping down in there. So we just immediately turned the downspout around, and that's one of the things too. People don't realize you can move your downspout; it doesn't have to be where it is. If you if it's like in the middle of your back uh, yard and it would be more, more handy if you just move the downspout over. Uh, it's, it's a pretty inexpensive fix to just move where the downspout is coming off of and, and bringing your water to. So that's one thing. And then other times too, uh, you can do just like a curb cut. Uh, you do like a eight inch cut 
in, in a sidewalk and uh, you can bury it with a PVC pipe to, to move the water underneath and put some pea gravel over top. And, and it's, it's fine too. You can also move water into rain gardens that way if you have a sidewalk in the way or something. But you can see this was a lot of water we had to manage. It was 258 square foot roof. Uh, we needed to have an 86 square foot uh, garden. Uh, minimum, we made 137 one because we also were getting runoff from our patio here. And believe it, uh, I have not seen this much water since the rain garden has been uh, installed. And um, the plants are really doing the trick. Uh, the, the, the main uh, focal point is my blue beech, which I absolutely love and adore. It's a Carpinus caroliniana. Uh, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna grow into that space nicely because it doesn't get bigger than 20 feet. <laughs> I planted it on center so it would have room to grow. And um, that's another thing I just wanna totally tell everybody, whenever you buy a plant, check to see what its maximum growth size is and plan to plant it so that it can grow into that space without annoying the heck out of you. <laughs> so remember, think before you plant. Okay, when I did plant this garden initially, uh, this was a more immature tree. And so I had two of these black blue flag irises in here. Um, I also had in nodding onion, uh, Amsonia, Tabernay, Montana, the var salicifolia. The, those guys are here and they got bigger and chunkier. Now I've got three of them in there. They look like little mini shrubs and, and they're beautiful when they flower. I've got, got some pictures of that. Uh, then I also have my favorite Jacob's Ladders everywhere. Uh, again, we've come back to that skull cap and the um, zigzag goldenrod, which is really easy to manage in my small garden. And then that golden Alexander. And again, I, I, I definitely take the seed heads off those puppies. Okay, so this is just the evolution of the garden. So now the tree is growing up. I decided to move the Joe Pye weed that I had in there and uh, one of the irises to another garden. And um, it, in the meantime, uh, the, 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 the redwood, the dogwood grew up a little bit more too, and he helps manage water. And um, I also have the, the, the stand of uh, 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 Golden Alexander is a little bigger uh, in front of the, uh, the AC now. And then there's that white digitalis uh, that likes it because that's actually a very hot spot in the backyard. Whereas this other half of the garden is really like almost deep shade. So it's really funny. You can have like a prairie condition almost right next to a, 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 a part shade condition. Um, garden. So uh, in the front yard, this is a, a small uh, rain garden that we put in and we just evolved it a little at a time. And that's another thing is people always think I've, I've got to do this huge project, take everything out. Yeah, you can just take out, uh, you know, a little bit of grass. I'll show you in a minute. Um, it's really simple to create uh, a rain receiving garden. I could, you could even say that. Uh, you take out the grass and you've got a, a four inch uh, deep rain garden bed ready to go to manage any water coming off of a thing. You just have to level it so it can pond and sit and not want to go somewhere. And so in this garden at the very front, we have uh, Mimulus ringets. Um, it, it is you know, part more of a part sun than a part shade plant. At the time we planted it here, it was a part shade area. So it was there, it was doing its job in the water. It loves rain gardens, but it was going eh. And I've seen it in a part sun garden where it went ah, yeah. So it got about this much taller, which was really interesting to see uh, when the plants are being challenged, how they had they, they adapt or adopt different behaviors. Um, and now that this, uh, that elm tree is down, this may become a much happier spot for the Mimulus ringens, the monkey flower. Um, this is a larger, uh, I've got a, a little blue stem in here. And then I have behind that, a, a, a couple of fox sedges, uh, another great water loving, larger kind of uh, grassy, uh, flowing uh, a sort of a fountainy um, carex that you can use. And their parts sun to even, they can take a little hotter uh, if they have enough water. 
And then on the edge, again, I have that uh, James sedge, uh, and then we've got a, a milkweed in there, that swamp milkweed's doing the trick. Behind him, we have uh, now a stand uh, growing uh, of lovely Queen of the Prairie, Philippendra rubra. Uh, this uh, Japanese maple has moved to another world, uh, and actually to another a client of mine <laughs> wanted it, so I said, you can have it. Um, and, and now I have a, a, a wild garden growing in the back corner here now too. And we also have in this garden, which you can't see right now, and again, we're going to be having more sun. I think the uh, lead plant's going to take off. And then I have also some of this, uh, the, the Slender Mountain Mint, the, the pi, uh, Pisinanthemum virginianum. And that, that plant um, again, in the part shade was kind of going, hey, I'll be here, but you know, and he was blooming and everything, but he wasn't really a stand. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how the, the garden evolves um, in response. And here it is. This is how easy it is. Everybody gets so intimidated. What? I can't make it easy. I can't make a rain garden. It's not easy. Yeah, it is. You just take the grass out and then you can do a little bit of, uh, of, um, uh, just sculpting the soil. Just think of it as sculpting, right? So in this situation, our neighbors downspout, like all the water just comes streaming down here and comes out in front of our house. And because I have this wonderful uh, maple tree uh, growing right across from there, it's, it's kind of tipped the sidewalk a little bit up. So what we did is we created a little rain swale here. And sure enough, when we had those big rains, uh, uh, some of that water actually ended up sliding in here and we managed a little more of that downspout water coming off uh, and gushing around uh, into a place where it could be serving uh, both uh, the world and uh, yeah, keeping it out of the stormwater system. So uh, remember, if you just take it off in clumps, uh, like you just, if you get your shovel and make a, four, a foot by foot square piece, and then uh, dig down and pull it out. You've got a four inch ponding area right there. And all you have to do is level it, make it flat. You can get yourself a, a, a level to make sure it's the ponding area. And then you can have a little bit of a slope. And if you have no place to put the soil, you can create a berm. This is a berm here. So we, we, we did that. So um, yeah, it can be easy. Ah, so volunteers that, uh, see how we're doing on time here. Um, oh, am I going over? Is it time to stop? <laughs> or shall I keep going? Ah, keep anyways, going. Um, Finish up. Let me look up here. What Laura's got to say. <laughs> I think you're fine, Julia. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll just keep going here. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, uh, um, I got out of the flow for a minute there, I apologize. So anyways, if, if we take a new garden and uh, we're, we're, we're wanting to uh, wild, we wanna get, get, get the, the garden a little wilder, uh, we can always work with things that are like remaining and then just keep adding in with the new natives. And um, in this case, uh, we had the, um, uh, questionable to be planted a trumpet vine, which uh, is considered a native and you definitely will see hummingbirds coming here. It, it can be really problematic and go all over the place. Uh, we had to take out about 25 different runners from this garden, uh, but the client wanted to keep it, a, a portion of it. So we just uh, uh, put a little uh, root barrier into this side and on the other side is an alley. So uh, that, that might help manage that plant and keep him in his place a little more. And we added in some, some blue stem. This is one of those part sun gardens. So we're getting that early morning sun and uh, it, it moves through uh, from the east to west this way. And then, so we, we've got that block and that cover during the hot, hottest time of the day. We have the, the swamp milkweed, the grace, I think we put some gray sedge in here too, which is a really wonderful plant. We'll see some pictures of that in a minute. Then we have the ostrich fern, which uh, is a common in many gardens. 
Uh, we've got the wild geranium. Uh, we put in some GM prairie smoke here too, and that's doing quite well. And then we had the common milkweed here to begin with. And the client said, eh, let's leave a couple of the daylilies, even though I want, I know they're gonna get gone in, in the long run. But uh, whoo, the thing we wanna pay attention to, I apologize. The thing we wanna pay attention to is this client did not tell us when we went to work with, to make the rain garden. So we actually uh, graded this so that the water would take water from the whole property and, and hold it and manage it uh, in this back garden, uh, that there was lesser celadine. And so we ended up by accident actually spreading the lesser celadine um, bulblets all over. So it is now totally infested. So we, she doesn't want to use any pesticides. And um, so we're just test, testing to see um, how much it, uh, it actually harms or uh, dissuades the, the plant, the natives that we had put in already. And this was after their first spring with the celadine, lesser celadine, and they seem to be doing pretty well. And so uh, and then the, the picture on the right actually illustrates, you know, we've got the golden Alexander uh, is going to be coming up and uh, it seems to be withstanding and uh, the, the population there. The spring beauties, they're going to probably be gone at uh, the Claytonia uh, after a, a couple more years because uh, they are in the same life cycle, the ephemeral cycle in the uh, early spring and uh, at the lesser celadine are just going to win that one. So um, pay attention if you're going to start working in a garden, uh, start in the spring looking and evaluating and seeing if you have any lesser celadine, take it down, out down to the root system, like try and go down at least six inches and, and make sure that all of the little bulblets are coming out with the plant and uh, throw it away. Um, so uh, that's a, a cautionary note. Um, this is a fun thing if you want to get geeky with it, you can um, see which plants you're putting into your garden and pay attention and see if you're going to be having enough uh, bloom cycles uh, for all of your uh, pollinators coming through during the season and also just kind of get an idea of the, the colors and shades that are going to be in the garden as well. Um, in this one, we actually uh, are you going to use the, the virgin's bower? And we're going to add in some of the spring beauties. So we're, we're making room and habitat for them wherever uh, there is no competition from that other uh, lesser celadine. So this is just a, a, a beauty shot. Take a rest for a minute. <laughs> Enjoy a nice fall day. This is like going into early fall. Um, the, the, the wonderful Baptisia uh, there on the right hand side, actually it, it acts like a shrub barrier almost um, for the, the, the seeding area here. So it's almost like if you want to have a substitute hedge for uh, uh, the, the boxwoods, those larger boxwoods, you can say to the client, hey, why don't you try, the, try putting a Baptisia hedge in? You can actually, once it's bloomed, you can actually do a little pruning on it if you want and shape it. Um, yeah, and you got your blue lobelia. I love that plant. It's just, yeah, nature is lovely and wonderful. So, Here's one of my favorite little ground covers, uh, Pussy Toes, Antenaria uh, plantaginea. Uh, it's a plant for American lady butterflies. Uh, uh, again, this is one of those uh, plants you're gonna want a deadhead. It has seeds just like uh, your, our wonderful uh, dandelions. Uh, these are other parts on perennials with a shrub-like appearance. Um, we have uh, the Amsonia, which also has that sort of smaller shrubby feeling to it. Uh, if you want to have a placeholder kind of feeling plant. Uh, and then if you have that lacier feel, you can get the uh, Hubrechtii, which is the uh, narrow leaf blue star. Both plants are really lovely in any garden and you can you know, group them in threes, fives, whatever, to get that kind of feeling of a hedge or whatever. Um, an, another fun uh, part shade uh, plant, uh, thanks to thanks to uh, uh, Go Botany, uh, Donald Marin. Um, this is a wonderful uh, fruit of the Aurelia plant. Although it's not a shrub, it gets big. It gets up to three to four feet. So you want to make sure if you 
are putting these plants in, that you're going to have the space for them to be what they want to be when they're grown up. So pay attention to that. Think of on center, like uh, get get a ruler out if you need to and put put a, 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 a pin in the middle and just go around. Uh, if it's going to be like a three foot wide uh, circle, you know, take that front point, that middle point and make it one and a half feet and one and a half. That's that's a three foot diameter, you know, plant. So be prepared. Um, here's another wonderful rainwater management situation. We threw the rainwater um, into the front garden underneath the uh, uh, walkway and we graded it so that all the water in the bigger rain events uh, gushes out underneath the fence and then comes into this area. And then we also have one other downspout was hooked up and um, uh, sending water out to this area. I was just visiting uh, this client today and they said it worked like a dream and it was so much fun to watch. And uh, it's just, yeah, it, it, it's, it's lovely to build environments uh, that where nature can do its work and, and what it likes to do best. Uh, sometimes you have drier areas that you wanna manage in, uh, in the part shade. And uh, one of my favorite uh, dry, dry shade cut ground covers is the Eurubria, the big, big leaf aster. Then uh, Diarvella linicera, uh, bush honeysuckle, it'll sucker out. If you want to shape it, you can and control it a little bit, or you can let it get more lanky. It likes it dry. So um, don't, don't overwater that one or put it in too wet a, a spot. Um, Cynthia Carpus, the, the, uh, oh, okay. the coral berry, I can't. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't finish typing that one. But then to the right, uh, far right, we've got uh, one of the most uh, probably uh, 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 oh, uh, it can do as many different things uh, as as we want. Almost is the Virginia water leaf for um, shade and um, and part shade. So Virginia water leaf is a great ground cover for dry, wet, um, and it's pretty, and the pollinators love it when it's buzz time. Um, this is another uh, rain garden here we put in uh, at, to block the view uh, from the, the public who walks by the property. Um, it's a, a um, bottle brush buckeye, again, uh, from a little further south, but, but uh, Swink from uh, Jerry Wilhelm's first publication of the Chicago flora. Um, main flora of the Chicago region um, really likes this plant and they had really great um, uh, relationships to local uh, insect populations. So it's, it's a good plant to be bringing to this region and uh, doing this lovely job for us in the garden. Um, Rosy Sedge is one of my personal favorites in the rain gardens, you've seen those. Um, in this situation, it was a hotter garden. It was more sun than the client than the client had thought. And I, I originally thought it was more sun. And I would have put in prairie drop seed because uh, the, the, the rosy sedge gets kind of burnt out at this part of the garden where it's very happy where it actually has the part sun. But here it's almost full sun. Yeah. So, oh yeah, and then just uh, for, for uh, the shady or area, I would, uh, I would recommend to the client to put in this common blue wood aster, which is just divine and lovely. It has a great little personality. Um, more plantings for under uh, shady, uh, part shade areas. Uh, ferns are always great. Uh, in this scene, we have quaking aspens. Yes, they are from our, they are found in our region. Uh, it's a it's a nice plant, a nice tree to put in. They're more short lived, but um, it, it can be a, a lovely thing to hear the, the aspen leaves uh, in around uh, your your yard. I love also this plantain sedge. Uh, I've seen that growing naturally with uh, with uh, Jacob's ladder, uh, in, and it was really just a great combination to see in nature. And then here we have the wild ginger and uh, the lady ferns as well. Um, this viburnum there is not regionally, uh, it's not relevant to our region. I would probably have put in um, the, the, uh, the, the, the regional uh, witch hazel, which we'll see in a, a little bit. Here's some other savannah-esque uh, uh, plants that I got, got to play with uh, at Horner Park yesterday, taking a walk. And I actually am trying this Pacara obovata, the round leaf ragwort in my garden now. Um, the thing is you wanna always, like in 
get to know your friends before you invite them in and know what you're going to want to be dealing with. And uh, so I'm paying attention to see how much I want to let this uh, this plant grow into uh, a, a certain bed, area of my bed. And um, here's that gray sedge, the mace head sedge that I love to put uh, in rain gardens. It's, it's one of a more feature, a little taller plants uh, for the bed. And then who can ever resist the wild columbines? Such a lovely plant for this part shade. And it even can take a little bit of part sun if it's wet enough. And then uh, we savannas have sunny spots too, as we were talking about. So um, here are some wonderful examples of that. And uh, uh, thanks to Sarah Michelle, who's I know has given some wonderful things from Mc, uh, McHenry County uh, for you guys. Uh, she's uh, got this great example of this drop seed with the lead plant that I just adore. And I think it really just lets you know how, how lovely that plant could really be if we just have some patience and allow nature to grow into our gardens. And uh, uh, then here, uh, last but not least, we've got the uh, Chelone glabra white turtle head, uh, Cephalanthus occidentalis, the button bush. Uh, the, the white turtle head is especially nice because it is one of the host plants for our wonderful rusty patch bumblebee whom we were talking about at the opening of this show. And um, it's really cool to, uh, uh, we have uh, an initiative going on in our region here in Evanston and uh, you can see uh, how much uh, uh, range that the, the um, insect still has. And if we can just really give, give a, a boost to it by making sure that we plant these plants in our gardens. Virginia waterleaf is in there, the, the shooting star, the Virginia bluebells. Uh, a lot of the plants that we've talked about today um, um, are in here, the penstemons, the mint, you know, uh, it, it's white turtle head. These are the plants, the New Jersey tea, the lead plant, uh, button bush. So all of these plants um, can help to uh, give a uh, habitat for these wonderful plants. And then um, this is just, uh, oh, sorry. Just sort of a nice guide for the last plant of the season. Um, I wanted to uh, just take you on a little tour through this lovely uh, Virginia, uh, <laughs> this uh, uh, Hamamelis virginiana, the, the, um, the American uh, hazel, uh, witch hazel, which has a more spreading sort of behavior. And uh, it's more of a part shade plant than a part sun plant. But look at the blooms on that guy. And um, there's definitely been some wonderful insect activity on the leaves. Uh, the day I was out there, I saw there's a little spider up in the corner. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's so nice to make a home for nature in our yards and, and to invite these, uh, plant creatures to inhabit with us. And uh, they give us much, so much more than we could ever do for them. And uh, yeah. So um, again, many thanks to uh, Katie, uh, Kathy Brock, uh, her husband who, who put together the oaksavannas.org uh, has passed away now, but um, they're, they're a wonderful organization if you wanna uh, give them some support. Uh, the information's in the slide list too. And um, with that, I will close and thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was a jam packed <laughs> presentation. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm gonna give you a chance to get a drink of water, which you might need um, before questions. And if you don't mind, stop to stop sharing and I will just put up a little promo for our plant sale. Got it. Again, and then um, we'll take some questions. Uh, okay. okay, yeah, I've got a couple. And Hold please. on, Adrian, wait. All right. Sorry. We got, we got <laughs> No, it's okay. <laughs> Okay, so this slide just demonstrates a few of the plants we have for sale and that also were mentioned today in Julia's talk. Just so you remember, our plant sale ends tonight. Um, so please buy. Okay, now you can go, Adrian, sorry. Okay, so um, I have 
I, I too love that presentation and I learned quite a bit and I've got a lot of ideas for what I want to do in my, in my yard now. Um, uh, if I can fit anything else in, which many of us probably have that, <laughs> have that issue. Um, but I have the first question is, uh, what does burning benefit native shrubs? Mm -hmm. You know, I cannot say, I cannot give an intelligent answer to that question. I like everybody else here, I would probably start Googling <laughs> or I even better yet, I would probably call Remick <laughs> and I would, I would ask someone who's an experienced professional because uh, I've, I've witnessed burns, but I haven't really uh, had an opportunity to work uh, in restoration situations. So I can't answer that, sorry. Um, Illinois wildflowers, in their shrub section will often say this shrub has moderate resistance to burning. Uh, oh, so cool. that's, that's a place where you can look. Um, and some, some shrubs are more resistant than others, I think. Yeah, well. But I couldn't give you details. That's, I need to learn more about that too. Um, and another question, and this is one that I have actually, is okay, so the rain gardens are great for the rainy, rainy springs that we're having but we also tend to get quite dry in July and August. So how do these rain gardens that you've been talking about uh, do with when, when those drier conditions come in? Oh, that's, a, that, that, that's pretty simple. These plants have adapted to these conditions over eons, right? And mm -hmm. so when there's a quieter, uh, drier period, uh, they will go more dormant. For instance, the marsh marigolds, uh, if you're if, if they're in a wetter situation, um, they'll the, their leaves will stay longer. But these guys uh, almost act like ephemerals. Then uh, during drier periods, they'll they'll just die back, and they'll be back the next spring. Um, also, uh, if the way I look at it is, we are gardeners too. So we are. Uh, you, you, there's many ways to do a garden. You can put a garden in and, and let it go and just let it be what it is. Um, or you can add some water uh, if you have a drought like we did last summer. Uh, maybe just do like one day every three weeks where you just do a nice one inch uh, sort of slow trickle, let the water go down in. Um, but the plants usually make it through. Um, and they'll, 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 they'll come back and um, they, they hold their place, but they may not be as resilient. They might not, they may, I mean, they may not grow as lushly. So it's just, they, they conserve their energies just like uh, we conserve our energy during heat, right? We, we don't put as much energy out to, to do things. So these plants are not just um, wetland plants, which is the thing to pay attention to, too. That's why you look at, they are plants that have evolved or co-evolved in these changing situations. Like I always love thinking of the idea of mesic. So you'll see dry mesic or wet mesic, right? So some plants may um, uh, want more water for longer periods of time. Um, and others will say, ah, you can just flood me three times this spring and I'm fine for the rest of the season. So, it, it, you know, you get to know the plants. I I can't say that I know of any plants that have really just gone under and, and not come back that I've put into different um, sites. Uh, I know one time, uh, Oh, uh, the gal who does uh, good natured landscapes. Uh, she was she was saying uh, she uh, it was a very dry summer one summer and she didn't have any uh, blue lobelia come up, but the next year there it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of times too, you know, it might have also been in that seeding cycle that that uh, blue lobelia does too. So which I had just learned about when I was doing this study for the Savannahs too that that. All these plants have different personalities and ways of growing and adapting and, and working in the world. And um, we get the privilege and honor to be a part of that cycle when we plant them and invite them into our homes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. I, I know last year, my pagoda dogwood, I did water it a little bit because it likes it a little moister than, than it was having. Um, Okay, so next question. Not a problem with roof runoff, but after heavy rain, the sidewalk floods. Do you have a suggestion for that? Well, it always, you know, there, it, it, I, I have a rain garden thing I do. 
uh, where I say how to evaluate where's the water coming from and why is it sitting in a certain place. So what you do is you pay attention to uh, that sidewalk, what is feeding that water? What's the source of the water that's going to the sidewalk? Is the sidewalk uh, buckling down and, 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 and has it over time just sort of uh, come into this place of being the low spot? So sometimes, you know, it, it, you have to look at it and evaluate the situation. Is the water coming from the neighbor's downspout? Is it coming from my downspout? How, how is the water moving through the property? The thing to keep remembering is water always seeks the lowest place. That's the simple thing about water. I love it. And you, so you just pay attention to where is that water coming from? And then you try and just like we did in that one uh, slope where you, you just try to find where that source is and then encourage that water to not move to the lowest place. So you sort of try to intercept it before it gets there. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah. Can I ask a follow up to that? Because I have um, a similar situation to that. And I think the source of the, the water that accumulates on the sidewalk is actually the very compacted parkway. And okay. how do you, so I'm trying to plant that, but do you have any tips for softening up that soil? Yeah, oh, totally. Um, I, what, one thing I would do is I would grade down into, so you do, you do want to put a little slope from the sidewalk down into the area. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's what I that that little crescent garden I show at the very beginning with the with the James sedge and the and the myanthum the the uh, um, that's basically we, we just did a cut down into the ground and then what you do is you put some compost in there because compost just loves to or it can be leaf compost anything that just kind of helps the soil start to break up and 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 be able to. Uh, uh, take that in and then you put the plants in and then the natural uh, uh, from that point forward of your first planting, the natural cycling of, of the leaf mulch and stuff from nature is going to keep softening that soil and the, and the roots of the plants will have an opportunity to get started. You don't have to use a really rich compost or anything because I know native plants like it lean, but uh, it, it, it'll help you if you can just get the soil uh, uncompacted. And one of, the, one of the tools I love is there are these great big um, forks that you can use uh, in, um, uh, what are they called? Oh, you jump on them and it's just like, you just kind of loosen up this, the air. It, you just bring air into the soil, a broad <laughs> fork. It's a broad, broad fork, broad, broad fork. <laughs> yeah. So broad forks are brilliant because you can just kind of like put it in the ground, kind of nudge things around, just start to open up the space in between there. You know, what's really difficult with clay that's been compacted is it, the, the, the soils are just, it's a bunch of platelets that just have been smashed together and there's no air between them anymore. And so what you're trying to do is just help bring that space back in between the platelets a little bit without um, um, breaking up the profile too much. It's, it's just a nuance, you know, you, 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 and then, yeah, a little bit of compost, you know, a little, little bit of leaf mulch. I, it's the same difference. If you have sandy soil, if you have clay soil, a little bit of compost and the soil will start to do what it needs to do better. And then time. Yeah. And, time. and the plants, working with the plants. And the plants are the sponge. The root systems of those plants are, are what really starts to make a difference. And, you know, I have to say that that one example I showed you of all that water at the very base of the property and the clients were just really beside themselves with all that water, that that rain garden was actually smaller than the actual area that you saw the water used to uh, take over, right? Because it was also like a six inch deep ponding area. So it, 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 it's very interesting, yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, Karen has lots of Virginia bluebells in the shade garden. 
Uh, she says, I need to edit for neighboring plants, but how do they benefit the rusty patch bumblebees as they die back after spring? Is it okay to trim the messy old leaves after blooming? Yeah, well, basically what you want to do is let them be the mulch, right? They, they become that food for uh, the whole garden. Um, so you just kind of let the, the leaves die back down in between. And if you feel like they're getting in the way of one of the plants that's trying to come up, you just kind of put them to the side. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's a part of the cycle. And, and um, yeah, so, or if you want to tidy your garden and you can do that too, it's a garden and you are the gardener. So uh, uh, after uh, it, it has done its beneficial thing and it is fed, you want to make sure that the, that the leaves are no longer green, that they're yellow before you do your tidy up because you do want them to be able to feed the, the root system well enough before they go under for the season. So that would be my take on it. So you're allowed, to, if you want to tidy your garden, you can take them out. Uh, if you want to let nature do its cycle, you can leave them in because uh, if you look in, um, oh, this is really, I know everyone's probably seen this one in this tone, uh, the floor of the Chicago region. If you look in here and see what plants like to grow with that plant, uh, also, that, that's a very useful tool as well. You, you can understand which plants co-evolved with these guys and, and, and uh, uh, do well with the rich and blue bells. So. Okay, so that, yeah, that was, I, and I think, in my opinion, they, they go yellow and go die back much quicker than um, daffodil leaves. Do. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's surprising. And so, um, I've always found it's okay to just leave them because they're very quick about it. Okay, so Candace says, in general, why do you recommend not putting in a pipe underground for the rain garden versus sloping down the stone slope? Oh, oh uh, well, it, it, you know, I like I don't like plastic, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like like everyone else who lives in this culture and understands the, the challenges of, of our culture. I know sometimes you just have to use a plastic pipe and, and put it underneath things. So that's one of the reasons. The other one is, is that when, when water stays above ground, you know, if it's, if the water is already in that transit evaporation cycle, the more it stays on that ground level and is part of that system, the better. Um, it's just part of the cycle. Is that? Is oh, that yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot, of, a lot of, and then you've gotten many thanks, lovely teaching style, lots of useful information. And uh, there's one question that came just to me, I think, and that's um, the person who's only known as C uh, would like to know um, what are the benefits of white snake root versus lake bone set? Um, is one more progressive <laughs> than the other? I, I, I really, I, I can't answer that question. That's one of the mysteries of the universe that I have to <laughs> <let on>. Yeah, <laughs> they are, they are different. Uh, white snake root is now called Ageratum altissimum, whereas, yeah. yeah, and then you've got Eupatorium uh, serotinum, and they, uh -huh. they do look different. They, the leaves are shaped differently. They yeah. benefit a lot of the same um Pollinators. Pollinators. I, I believe that they, the, the adjurate, the um, white bone set starts blooming earlier than the late bone set. Okay. That's my impression. And the snake okay. root, of course, goes around more. <laughs> it does. When it, it sets does. up the stand. Right. It, yeah. Uh, it's a little more work to get rid of. Right. I, yeah. I, I have it all over my garden. I like it. Oh, I like yeah. it too, but I had someone pass by one day while I was out gardening and I heard him not so quietly whisper to whoever he was walking with, looking at the white snake root. That's the plant I try to get out of my garden. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Just put up a sign that says, this benefits the rusty patch. Right? <laughs> yeah. just, just don't graze your cattle here. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just don't graze your cattle there. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're much more, you are much more likely to have the white snake root though than the late bone set. And the late bone set's actually a little taller too. Yeah. And it might like it a little wetter. 
but I might be wrong on that. Thank you, Adrian, for fielding that question for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, have a, we have a lot of it down at National Grove. <laughs> Anyone else? Do you have any last questions for Julia? Um, if not, then uh, Julia, thank you. That was really informative, jam-packed, helpful, and as Adrian said, inspirational. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Love you guys. <laughs> Your organization's been oh, like, you. you've helped me become the person I am. Oh, you know? wow. Wow. Well, no, we all, we all need to learn. Yeah, I hope Stephanie still is on to hear that. <laughs> yeah, Stephanie was like, she, she's she's the number one gal. Yeah, yeah, she sure is. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye bye, Julia. Bye bye. Oh, can I have a copy of the comments? Yes. You That'd can. be super duper. Let me take, make a note of, oh, let me stop recording. And like I said, this will be up in about a week and then we will send the link and we'll